Our text in Galatians 3 will be verses 19 to 25. Paul writes, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. <clears throat> um, most of the New Testament letters are written to combat false teaching in the church. And Galatians is no different. The specific uh, false teaching in the churches in Galatia was done by men who we call the Judaizers, who called themselves Christians. Uh, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed that Jesus was the Son of God. But they taught that uh, Christians were to live basically under the Old Covenant. Uh, they taught that Christians needed to become Jews. Uh, Christians need to get circumcised to become Jewish. And then Christians needed to follow the old Mosaic laws and covenant uh, in order to be saved. Something which Paul rejects. That's what the entire letter to the Galatians is about. Um, so let me remind you what Paul has said thus far in chapter 3. So we know what he's talking about in our passage today. Paul started off chapter 3 by calling the Galatians fools who are considering going and getting circumcised and becoming Jewish in order to be saved. And he reminded them that they received the Holy Spirit through faith, not by the works of the law. Then he brought the example of Abraham and showed them how Abraham was justified by faith, not by the works of the law. He then explained that the law places a curse upon people because everyone has broken the law and Christ came to redeem us from the curse of the law. And last week in our text, we looked at how God made a promise to Abraham. And in essence, the, the, the point of that promise was that those who are of faith, those who are his descendants, but meaning those who have the faith of Abraham, would be saved, basically. Uh, the promise was about salvation. And the point that Paul was making in our, week, in our text last week was that since God made the promise to Abraham that those who have faith will be saved, um, the fact that 430 years later God gave the law through Moses, that does not change the promise that was given to Abraham. The law, which was given at the time at Sinai, does not annul or change the promise of salvation through faith. Which leads us to a very serious and honest question. In verse 19, he says, What purpose then does the law serve? Because he has just said, you're not justified by the law. You don't receive the Holy Spirit by the law. You don't receive your inheritance by the law. So someone may ask, okay, well then what's the point of the law? <laughs> Why did God even give the law through Moses? It seems as though Paul is saying, there was really no point for the law. It seems that way. It's as though he's saying it's useless. You don't need, we didn't need that. Forget about the law. Uh, in Acts 21, when Paul uh, had gone to the temple uh, in Jerusalem, he was attacked by the Jews. And they were yelling, this man is a, teaches against the law and this people. And so it may seem on the surface to the Galatians as they're reading this, and to the Judaizers, who would also be in the congregation in Galatia, um, that Paul is saying the only thing that matters is God promised Abraham, which is fulfilled in Christ, and 
forget all about Moses, forget all about the law. It's, it's not important. So Paul has to answer this question. What was the point of the law? And so when we're talking about the law in this context, we're talking about the Mosaic covenant of law, <clears throat> the whole Jewish uh, law system that God gave 430 years later to Moses. So what's the point of that? Why did God do that? Um, now before, I, before we go through what Paul's uh, explanation is, just a few words on the law of Moses, just so we know what it was, and so we understand what Paul is referring to. The covenant that was made with Moses on Sinai, the giving of the law, was quite different from the covenant that God made with Abraham. Um, if you recall, the covenant that God made with Abraham, well, from the beginning, God had said to Abraham, through your seed, all the nations are going to be blessed. So, right from the beginning, the, uh, the promise that was given to Abraham had a universal scope. It was for the world. The covenant that was made with Moses, with the law, was specifically for the nation of Israel as a nation, distinct from the other nations. Um, <clears throat> the promise to Abraham was that all who had all who were his descendants through faith would receive the inheritance the, the law given at the time of Moses the, the covenant that was given at the time of Moses was do this and I'll bless you do this, do this, do this, do this if you don't do it, I'll curse you that was the covenant with Moses um, the Mosaic law was an entire huge administration it was an entire structure of law over the nation of Israel as a special people distinct from the rest of the nations. Um, and it was designed to keep Israel to be different from the rest of the nations. First of all, God gave them moral laws. Within this entire system, there were moral laws like the Ten Commandments uh, because uh, you know the, the Jews had just come out of Egypt had just come out of living amongst pagans for centuries. And God is saying, I don't want you to live like pagans. I don't want you to live like the people around here. You, I want this to be a holy, righteous nation. He gave them specific laws that would uh, differentiate them from the rest of the other nations. Things like uh, food laws. Your, other nations eat these things. I don't want you to eat them. Other nations dress this way. I don't want you to dress that way. Other nations shave their beards this way. I don't want you to do that. All kinds of stuff. They, um, the way they cook, the way they... If you go through the law, I mean, it, it deals with every minute detail of your life. How you go to the bathroom, how you, uh, what you do with your spouse, everything. Okay? Laws controlling everything. Uh, of course, he also gave civil laws. Uh, there was stuff like how to build your house. It was like, okay, if you build a house, put a railing at the top so you don't fall down. Everything. Um, how to deal with criminals. Um, tithing. Tithing was, a, was basically the tax system of Israel. So, and, then, and of course, the, right at the center of all this was the uh, laws concerning sacrifices. You had priests. You had sacrifices, you had the tabernacle, all these things showing them that their need for an atonement, their need for a savior, their need to be uh, death, to pay for sin, all these things. It was a huge elaborate system, this law of Moses, which separated Israel from the rest of the nations. And it is to that that the Judaizers are trying to bring the Galatians to. They're saying... God gave this law, this system, to His people. So if you want to be His people, you've got to be Jewish. Make sense? You've got to get circumcised. You've got to follow all these rules. You have to be Jewish. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Throughout the entire letter. Okay, so, since we're not justified by the law, since we don't receive the Spirit by the law, since we don't get the inheritance by the law, but it is through faith... What's the point of the law? Why did God give this system to Moses? And 
Let me just make a quick side note here. Paul is not going to address every aspect of the law. He's not going to give us every uh, thing, every, every single reason why the law was given. He's going to be focusing specifically on uh, what the Judaizers were talking about and dealing with them. So, verse 19, he says, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions until the seed should come, that's Christ, to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now Paul will expand on this in the next few verses but let's just look at what this verse says briefly. First of all, he says the law was added because of transgressions. Well, obviously, God's people, even though they're God's people, they're still sinful people and they need to be led, they need to be guided to know how to live especially the Jews coming out of Egypt and going to live in other lands which were uh, occupied by pagans. In Leviticus 18, verses 1 to 4, it says this, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, I am the Lord your God. According to the doings of the land of Egypt where you dwelt, you shall not do. And according to the doings of the land of Canaan where I am bringing you, you shall not do. Nor shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. The law was given, first of all, because people are sinners. And the law is there to guide people in a sense, also to restrain people. The law does have a restraining function to it. If I say that I wanted to murder my neighbor... But I don't do it. Someone may say, oh good, you love your neighbor. Well, not really. I want to kill him, but I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to be executed. So I won't do it because of the law that's over me, which kind of restrains evil in the world. Limits how evil men act in the world. But here's what's important, and this is what Paul is going to get into more later on. He says the law was added until the seed should come. He's talking now about the entirety of the Mosaic Old Covenant. The law of Moses as a Jewish system which separated Jews from the rest of the nations was temporary. It had a beginning and it had an end. The beginning was at Mount Sinai. The end is when Christ came. The Mosaic Law, in a way, in a sense, was a parenthesis in history when God, for a time, almost a millennium and a half, focused on the nation of Israel. We'll discuss that more later on in the text. And he closes by saying, The law was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. And verse 20 says, Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Now, that's a strange statement. Uh, there are hundreds of different interpretations for that. <laughs> We're not going to go through them all. <laughs> um, I'm assuming that, the Galatians, that Paul has already spoken to the Galatians about a number of things, so maybe they understand exactly what he's talking about. Uh, it's a strange statement. The words aren't difficult. He says, a mediator does not mediate for one only. Well, obviously, the mediator is for two different parties who stands between. We get that. And God is one. I get that also. But what does that have to do with what Paul is talking about? Probably, probably what he's talking about here. Uh, because he has said, first of all, the law um, was given way after the promise, chronologically. Then he has said uh, that the law was temporary, unlike the promise, which still stands. And it seems now that perhaps he's saying something about how the law was given through a mediator, that's Moses. But the promise was not. The promise was given directly by God to Abraham. So it may have something to do with the difference between, because that's what he's been talking about, the difference between the covenant with Abraham and the covenant with Moses. So it may be that he's 
saying somehow that the promise is superior to the, pro to the covenant with Moses because God gave that directly without a mediator. Perhaps. It's not, it's not perfectly clear. But look at verse 21 now. The next question is this. Is the law then against the promises of God? Stop right there. At this point, someone may say, <laughs> All right, Paul. <laughs> Just admit it. You don't like the law. You don't like the law. You, you don't like the old Mosaic Covenant. Uh, you think that the, that the law is an enemy to the promise. Is an enemy to the gospel. You think that the law contradicts the promise. You think that the law is opposed to the promise. You think that we have these two different entities, the promise of salvation through faith and the law given through Moses and you're like, I, I like the promise, I don't like the one, I don't like the, pro I don't like the covenant with Moses. This one is good, that one's bad. Just admit you don't like the law and say, okay, the two are opposed to one another, I prefer this one, not that one. Paul's answer is, certainly not. Absolutely not. That is not what I'm saying at all. Mi yenito. May it never be. Look, God, God is one. He just stated that. Okay, God is not schizophrenic. God doesn't give two different opposing systems, one against the other. God gave both. God gave the covenant to Abraham. God gave the covenant with Moses. God does not contradict himself. God is not against himself. So, that would mean that these two systems, the promise and the law, aren't against each other, they complement each other in some way. So, he says, look at verse 21 and verse 22. He says, certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, he starts off and he says, if there had been a law that could give life, oh, then we'd be saved by the law. What's his point here? Try and follow me here. I'm going to try and explain it. If the law gave life, if the law made you righteous, which it didn't, if the law made you righteous, then we would have two opposing systems. You would have the promise on the one hand, and you would have the law. And both of them would be giving life and righteousness. And then they would be opposed to one another. And you'd be like, okay, I'd rather go with this one or with this one. I'd rather go with this one or with this one. But that's not the point. There was never a law that gave life. The law was never given to make anyone righteous. He says all. The scripture says that all are sinners. Everyone has broken the law. And since everyone has broken the law, obviously you can't be saved by the law. The purpose of the law was never to save anyone. That's why it's not contradicting the promise. For we are only saved through faith. Therefore the law, the law and the promise are not opposed. They have different functions. Okay, so you'll say, okay, thus far you've been telling me what the law does not do. What is the purpose of the law? Why did God give this mosaic Law. Verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. Kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now, these verses have been highly mistreated and distorted by good evangelicals, good Christian brothers. Because they often read these verses apart from the context. Usually how these verses are used, because it is, it, it, he, is using an example, he is using an example of a man coming to faith. And so it confuses us. And so most people take this passage to say, well, what this, when it talks about that the law was our tutor, was there to bring us to Christ, they say, this passage is about an individual who, and where the law works in his life, 
and he sees that he has disobeyed the law and therefore he sees his need for a savior and therefore the law drives him to Christ. Now, even though that concept is, is true in one sense and Paul does talk about that elsewhere, that is not what he's talking about here. He is not talking about the work of the law in an individual's life to bring him to faith in Christ. He has been talking historically about how the law was added 430 years after Abraham. He is talking about how the law functioned temporarily to bring the nation of Israel to the point when the Messiah would come. That's what he said in verse 19, where he was like it was giving for a time. From then till then. That's what he's talking about here. Look at verse 23. He says, But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Now, it actually should say before the faith came. That's a better translation. Before the faith came. And so he's talking about a body of faith. The gospel um, the, the things that are believed concerning Christ's death and resurrection, those things that have been revealed now with a new covenant. That is what he is referring to. And he says, we were kept under the Mosaic covenant, under the law, under this old system, with the priests, with the sacrifices, with the temples, with the washings, with the food laws, all these things which distinguished us from the rest of the other nations. We were kept under these things until Christ should come. But after that, it's over. This old covenant is over. Remember in John chapter 4. Uh, Jesus is talking with Samaritan. Samaritan lady at the well. And he's trying to point out her sin. She's just trying to avoid and getting all religious on him. So she says, you know, we Samaritans, we worship up on this mountain here. You Jews, you say that we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. Which one is the correct one? What's Jesus' answer? Neither. Neither. It's not about the mountain up there. It's not about Jerusalem. What does he say? But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's not about the temple. Forget about the temple. Forget about the sacrifices. Forget about this whole uh, special Jewish system that existed. The old Mosaic covenant is over because it's fulfilled in Christ. And then verse 24, he says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. The tutor, that's a bad translation. In the King James it says the law was our schoolmaster. That's an even worse translation. That's not what it is. The Greek word is pedagogos. The pedagogue. Now, there, we have tons and tons and tons of ancient writings telling us exactly what the pedagogue was. The pedagogue was a guy, a servant in a house, slave, who was highly trusted, and he was told to um, supervise, watch over a child until the child would become mature. Um, the pedagogue would make sure that the kid went to school. He would make sure that the kid would get back from school safely. The pedagogue would make sure that the kid ate his food, that he went to bed on time, that he did his homework. There are pictures uh, that uh, show the pedagogue <laughs> with a rod in his hand. <laughs> he was a disciplinarian to make sure the kid stayed on track. He was not a teacher, specifically. Of course, in one, in one sense you could say he was a teacher because he was teaching him to you know, do things that are supposed to be done. But he was a disciplinarian to keep the child in place. And the Mosaic law functioned over Israel like a pedagogue saying, don't be like the rest of the nations. Don't do this. Don't do that. And to remind them through the sacrificial system and all these things, you need someone to pay for your sins. You need atonement. And all these things are fulfilled in Christ who died for our sins. And so in verse 25, he says, But after faith has come, and again he's referring to the New 
Testament faith, we are no longer under a tutor. With the, passing of child, with the passing of time, the child grows up. He matures. He doesn't need to be told to eat his food. He doesn't need to be told to do his work. And so he is no longer under the pedagogue. What Paul is saying is this to the church in Galatia. He's saying, look, something that we need to understand here. 20 years ago, because this was written around 50 AD, 20 years ago something happened that changed everything. 20 years ago, the world changed. Everything changed when the Messiah came and fulfilled the law perfectly. Christ is our high priest who stands between man and God. Christ is our sacrifice who pays for our sins. Christ is our temple to whom we go to worship. Not to mention the fact that he obeyed everything in the law perfectly on our behalf that we may gain his righteousness. The old Jewish Mosaic covenant is over, it is fulfilled, and now we are under a new covenant in the blood of Christ. This is why our Bibles are separated into Old and New Testament. We're no longer under the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah prophesies of these days, 600 years before Christ, and he says these famous words, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I brought them, where I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Hebrews chapter 8 quotes that entire passage, the longest quote in the New Testament of the Old Testament, and says, that is fulfilled in Christ. We are under the new covenant, which is fulfilled with the coming of Christ. And Paul is saying to the Galatians, we're no longer under the law, the, under, the old Mosaic covenant, God had promised Abraham that those who have faith will be saved. That does not change. The Mosaic Covenant was temporal. It served its function to protect, to guide, to lead Israel until the Messiah would come. It was full of types and shadows. And it has been fulfilled. Christ is the reality. Christ is the fulfillment. So don't let anyone tell you. We need to go back and be under the law. As these Judaizers are trying to convince the Galatians. Thank you for your attention. Let's pray.